How you doing, man? Great to see you. Here we are. You look great. I appreciate that. Likewise. Very nice to see you. Let's give <laughs> cheers, you a little cheers, tea little cheers. Tea cheers. There you go. Excellent. Both drinking tea today. A little hot. Mm. A little hot. There we go. Ah, does the body good. Uh, well, when I see men with beards, the first thing I like to do is start off with telling them their beard looks great. I'm one to compliment facial hair or hair in general. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've, I've had this for a long time and um, was told that I could not win elected office with a beard and uh, somehow made it and I made it through. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I made it through. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, like, obviously the old, the old way of thinking was that you got to shave for, for politics. Not in California though, right? It's like a New York problem. You know, you, you would. I think, it, I think it's more now versus before. I just think it was like, I think beards are much more in than they were. I guess so, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, just go back and look. Go back and look at movies from 20 years ago, you know, versus today. Like, just a lot more people with facial hair now. Yeah, well, baldness well, was definitely go. not in a long time ago. I don't know, man. I don't know. It's always. Bruce uh, Willis started it. Yeah? I okay. think so. He was my inspiration. Picard, you know. You know, when I saw Bruce, I was like, all right, it's yeah, time. Because yeah. I was losing it. It was so hard to do. And I'm like, all right, it's time. All right, all right. It's time. All right, but, all right. Uh, Connery, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, it's it's great to have you here. I'm excited to get into some, some fun topics. As I always like to say, you know, the purpose of this is really to help people think about conversations, uh, difficult conversations in a civil way. Um, and in that regard, have meta politics conversations how to destroy this us and them mentality yeah. the toxic polarity that exists at all the levels of politics um and to think about really what's needed and um to to make it a better space for people yeah yeah no i'm looking forward to it i i we are we have to we have so much more in common than uh, we have in in terms of difference and yet that doesn't seem to be what people focus on Right, and so I love, I love the, the kind of basic premise of your show. I, I'm just trying to have conversations so we can get to know each other better and build more dialogue, and also build more opportunities for people to feel like they can access their government and and, and really engage with their government. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I should first congratulate you on a, a pretty big accomplishment. Uh, it took some years, but a new bill has been passed. Yeah, very exciting. I mean, this is our SB 54, uh, a, you know, a sweeping uh, plastics pollution bill that we just got through the legislature after four years of work. Lots of uh, lots of ups and downs, and you know, literally up maybe two weeks ago, we thought this whole thing was dead, and we finally got it across the finish line. It was the product of, of many many months of of really intense negotiation between business and the environmental community, and we ultimately got it passed, um, you know, with the bipartisan support, and uh, as a result, we. You know, the, the, the plastics measure that had qualified for the ballot is now going to be off the ballot. And now we have a really strong nation leading policy that will give the producers who have the most control over the stuff that gets out there, the plastic that gets out there, more responsibility associated with the end use of their products. It's a producer responsibility system, extended producer responsibility system. And you know, I, I got to say, it's an example of, of what you were talking about earlier. I mean, you know, here we are in this really polarized moment. And yet we were able here in California to bring together business leaders, environmental leaders, environmental justice folks, I mean, and, and folks from across the business spectrum too. I mean, from the haulers to, uh, to, to, to retailers and grocers and, and distributors and everybody in between, producers, and then of course local government as well, to come up with a solution that ultimately won support from both uh, both Democrats and Republicans. And I was just so proud of that. Unanimously. Uh, it wasn't unanimous. There were certainly, unanimous. no, there were still some folks who, who, who did not support. Um, but uh, but but nevertheless, we had strong uh, bipartisan support in both houses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good example of um, the ability to do what exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Create the kind of consensus. In the, it's, it, it doesn't happen as often as it should, yeah. uh, and especially not on really big things. Because yeah. it's hard. I think, you know, you get a lot of vested interests and a lot of people that get kind of stuck in. And it was interesting. I mean, the Howard Jarvis Association came out against it because um, there is a there's a there's a fee mechanism associated with it. Though, of course, one of the arguments we made all the time, and I think resonated with other taxpayer groups, that actually the status quo is more costly for regular folks. I mean, the, the League of Cities just came out with a study saying that they're going to have to jack up everybody's waste hauler rates, mm -hmm. you know, the rates that you pay for your trash pickup. Uh, so that's coming out of people's pockets, partly because we have so little coherence in our waste system. All this junk just keeps flooding. There's no, there's no mechanism for accountability or even responsi any responsibility on the part of the producers. Uh, so by, by creating more coherence, it will actually uh, lead to, to lower rates in the long run. 
uh, or at least stem the ever increasing rates. And so that, that has to be factored in as well when people are thinking about um, the front end costs that might be uh, initially put on, on, on some of the new products that are going to be out there as a result of this bill. So as a result, Caltax Association, for example, state, you know, they, didn't, they didn't come out in opposition and they're a really important mm -hmm. taxpayer organization. I think they realized that there was a lot of wisdom to what we were trying to do. Uh, but because Howard Jarvis came out against, a lot of Republicans got really nervous because yeah. uh, they're, you know, it's hard to break with them when you're when you're on that side of the aisle. Uh, but some very you know bold folks saw what the value of what we we're doing, saw the fact that the Chamber of Commerce was asking for folks to support it, the agricultural community saw that it was really a grand compromise, and and saw the wisdom of what we'd done, and they voted for it. Yeah. Well, this is this is, and this sort of goes into this interesting concept of. You know, when when you're a senator or you're at any level of politics, there's certain knowledge that you have that no one or, or the way that things work that you just don't know unless you're a senator. Yeah. There's just no way for people to understand that what the day to day looks like for you. Right. Well, that's true. And I think um, and, I, and actually, especially in state government, there's so little uh, media attention. I mean, there's so much media attention on the federal. Right. And then obviously people care a lot about the local because it's so close to them. But the state has a lot of power and a lot of interesting things happening there. And yet it's amazing how little uh, uh, scrutiny and, and how much how little press attention is up there. It doesn't glitter like the federal politics for I some guess. reason. I don't know why. And yet, and yet, especially given how polarized Washington is, there's so much more interesting work happening at the state yeah. level. Uh, and yet there's a fraction of the correspondence, a fraction of that. I mean, I don't know. You think about the fact that we live in a state of 40 million people. I was in, I don't know, a few years back, I was in New Zealand. I don't know, New Zealand probably has 5 million people. And you know, Australia, I went to afterwards, 26 million people, right? So significantly less, both of them, significantly less than we have. And in fact, our economy is far bigger than both. And yet, in both countries, you had several major you know, different you know, news channels, lots of major national newspapers, all of this attention on their own national politics. And, it's, and, and yet, in Sacramento, I think we're down to like 14 full-time correspondence there now uh, from, from the media. It used to be about 50 hmm. back in the day. It's just extraordinary. Why is that? Why do you think this is? Well, I think it's, it's it, so f it's cheaper and easier to just have everyone, to, to have all the news focus on, on, on Washington uh, because, you, you know, as opposed to having to set up shop in 50 different states. Now, I would argue that you could set up shop in Sacramento and, and cover California and there would actually be a lot of interest. Um, but it is the fifth biggest economy yeah, in the world. Yeah, fifth biggest economy in the world. And with 40 million people just here, <laughs> and, and so many people here, right? I mean, there's so many big markets. If you think about San Diego, it's like a, it's like it's the third largest city in the state. It would be the most important city in most other states, right? I mean, yeah. on its own. Sacramento as well is a massive city, but it, nobody thinks of it as an important city, you know, compared to San Francisco and Los Angeles, right? Yeah. And even within San Francisco and Los Angeles, you've got... You know, all these, you got Orange County and you got the Inland Empire, you got the South Bay and you got the East Bay up in uh, you know, Marin. I mean, these, these enormous megaliths of, 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 of power and, and motion and, and innovation that are happening up and down our state. And yet, I, yeah, I think it's an issue of um, these, these national cable news channels that have really honed a certain model. And of course, so much of it's based on trying to stoke pre-existing biases and feelings and contentiousness and contentiousness engagement whatever right. clickbait you can throw out there to get people to watch it right and and I, you know I, I just think that they've got that model they're working on it they're doubling down on it it works for them and it's cheap right because you can you can run the same stories send it nationwide as opposed to having um, uh, you know a, a standalone news channel for all these different states well the opposite of saying the opposite of what you're saying is because um, you're saying it's cheap, the the, the uh, diametric opposite would be it's um, not profitable, right? Is it a, is it is it a is well, it cable a, news has been profitable in the, at the state level at, at the national level, right? right. So is it prof is it both cheap and not profitable to to do that because it doesn't get the kind of attention you think, or is it just because it's less? As Expensive. Yeah, I, it's a good question. I mean, I think, and look, I, the last thing I want is for us to recreate a Fox News for California, right? Like a Fox News MSNBC battle. Like, right. I just don't think that would be helpful. A right? localized like, version. Like, of I, I would want more of a thoughtful kind of PBS, right? But then, but then again, maybe that's just not what people. That's not what makes the money. 
right? So, um, so, so I, maybe I need to care, be careful what I wish for. I, I don't know. I just I look at other countries, and I, I, I mentioned Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada. I mean, these are all countries from the British tradition, where they have for quite some time had a BBC, like a publicly funded, well resourced, very well respected public broadcasting system. Uh, which of course we have too with PBS, but it's nowhere near as as robust and as well funded, it's, and it's yeah. nowhere near as central to the culture as what as is exists in, in these Commonwealth countries that I just mentioned. And I think that I think the BBC and and their equivalents, CBC, ABC, you know, these different countries, raise the bar. It 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 it, it, it creates a standard for quality of television and engagement and discussion that actually force all the channels up a little bit. You know, even yeah. the private channels. Um, there, there's just like a, le- a higher level of discourse and discussion when they talk about politics. It's, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that they're not problems in these countries, but you go to the, you go to these countries and you watch their news, you watch the way they talk about their politics, and there's, there's just more, there's more substance than when you turn on our, our cable news. Sure. Where, and our cable news is just, just based on the, they'll just, they'll just parse apart the latest tweet, Trump tweet for an hour and just, just based rap on clicks. about it. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard because. If you look at how they're funded, and a lot of them are strictly funded on advertising dollars, and you could say, well, who's funding them? And you can get down this rabbit hole of like, you know, your bottom line and your funders are your most important parts of any business. So if that's if that's the case, is that is where do we draw the line between what's allowed there to give people the right information and to not have biased information? Because it seems like that's the most popular thing that people make their public decisions on based on private news yeah it's really yeah kind of weird true. right that's yeah, true so yeah. it's like wow. okay the public private conversation there can can go in a lot of ways yeah, no, that's true it's a problem it's a problem and uh, you know i i um it's one of the many things we got to work on yeah you know, it's part of what you're combating here at the yeah. local level evan well we have a lot of there's a lot of information um, malinformation out there yep. and or biased information right or just uneducated information right it can, or AI, right? And and you're, I, and, and you're right. I do. I mean, you're early. We got onto this tangent because you talked about how you can't expect the average person to really um, understand all that goes behind the scenes uh, when it comes to legislation. I guess what I would say is it's up to us, you know, who are in politics, our staffs, I mean, and the reporters, and all the, all of us that are in this world, to to try to work more to reach out to constituents and reach out to the public and explain what we're doing and bring people in. And then I would say on on the other on the reverse, just to say to folks, this system is a lot more accessible than you think. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people look at the news; it looks very far away. It looks like something that they don't, they can't influence. It's just kind of off in the distance. And yet, every elected official and their staffs are you know, from a community. They come from a place. I I'm, I grew up here in Santa Monica and served on the school board here. And, you know, raising my son here. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a member of this community. My, all my staff are members of this community. Uh, you know, there, there, there are lots of ways to, to get to know an elected official, an elected official staff, local elected officials, serve on a commission, get involved with a campaign, you know, show up at meetings. I mean, you know, involve, get yourself, you know, join a Democratic club or Republican club, whatever it is. Uh, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to engage in the system if you want to. It's there. It's accessible much yeah. more, I think, than people realize. Well, it's easy to. It's not that requires effort. What doesn't require effort is reading something you disagree with and then re- retweeting it or resharing it and going, "This sucks." It's an outrage. Yeah, that doesn't require effort. A it lot pro- less. Yeah, you're right. You know. Yeah. It, well, then you just get into the yeah. pool of nonsense right. of whatever. And but it it takes work. You have to make a commitment. You and have then to you show go down up. algorithmic rabbit holes. Algorithmic rabbit holes. <laughs> Which is yeah, like, yeah, which is yeah. unfair. It's one of the things I've actually thought about for even social media companies. It's like they should start, they should bias good things. There yeah. should be, if you're that powerful, totally. you should have an alg- the algorithm that says, you know what? This is, a, this is wonderful news. It's pure goodness. It helps humanity. We have a little part of the algorithm that puts that up to the top, not just things that people click on. Yeah. Because they are, this is part of that public-private. It's like private business influencing the public sphere yeah you're absolutely right and uh you know obviously we've got yeah you know, strong appropriately strong rules of you know, protecting freedom of speech and all the rest but i do think we're getting to a point where we've realized that the way the the un the unregulated the unregulated uh, a fro- flow of speech on on social media um and and, and, and well I, I think we need to figure out a way to 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 
push the social media companies to 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 steer away from from misinformation at the very least. Opinion is important, but but misinformation and uh, the constant uh, negativity that that seems to dominate a lot of people's feeds it's just it's not helpful. And vitriol. Yeah, vitriol, uh, violence. You can't it's get not helpful. That. It's, it's not, not helpful. Well, w- let me ask you this: What? Okay. Well, I was going to ask you what is misinformation, but let me let me. I like asking this better, more. What is a fact? That's a great question. I mean, I'm I'm I. I it's something. It's a. It, it is it is something that is absolutely grounded in truth. Uh, ideally, it's something that is evidence based, demonstrable, provable. I know, of course, there are some facts that are harder to prove than others. But um, but a yeah a a, a a a statement that is grounded in in, in truth and and that is that's that's provable. Yeah, I would say objectively. Objectively, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that without any, um, it can't it can't be misinterpreted. I would I, I imagine. Sure, of course, lots of facts are misinterpreted. Well, but, of course. Uh, well, but, because I don't think we have, I don't think we, people have the same definition of a fact, which sure. is why I ask it. You ask one person one definition, and then you ask someone else a different, and they their experience of that is different. And then you say, well, what are the things you read? Are you basing your anger on your definition of what a fact is? Because that's a pretty pure definition of a fact, right? When you read certain news and you get outraged, are you looking to make sure that what you're getting outraged on are actual facts that, that are in line with your definition of a fact? Or are you just getting the emotional portion of it then sharing it to a million people and right. quick to you know uh, confirm your own biases by calling up your, your best friend who believes exactly like you do right. and go, can you believe this is going on? Right. This is crazy. Right. You know, yeah, I think you're right. The la- it's usually the latter now. And, and as, as we've been discussing, right, the, the, the social media bias is... is toward doubling down on that approach, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, um, what's that great film that just came out, the documentary, The Social... Um, social Dilemma. Social Dilemma, yeah. It does a great job of spelling all that out Yeah, for folks who, who are interested in... He was on Joe Rogan, too. Oh, okay, good. And he, they, they speak at length about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is really interesting. Yeah. Um, actually, that's how I found out about um, the one he did with Daniel Schachtenberger, uh, they mentioned uh, Brave Angels guys. Oh, okay. Who I met with so that's last how they week. Came on. Yeah, yeah, and then I heard them, and I went and reached out to them because I was like, "This is a great mission." Yep. Um, we need more of that. Bridging their goal is to bridge red and blue through civil discussion, yeah. and, and understand, um, which is just the purpose of this too, to understand yeah. that our values of and aspirations are largely the same. Yeah. Absolutely. But our, our approach and our the narratives we read turn us into enemies. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and the media turns us into enemies, unfortunately, as in a, a lot of ways. I, you know, as a as a business model, sometimes you know. Yeah. You know, it's because uh, that's what, as you say, that's what gets people agitated and excited. Now, I mean, look. There, now, let's be fair. There are also a lot of really great, objective, hardworking, balanced journalists out For there sure. that uh, that are just struggling under mindful this, journalists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, under this uh, and struggling in, in in this environment where where. Uh, where their their entire profession has been attacked, and and um, they're just trying to to you know, keep keep their head down and, and keep reporting the you know, the facts, like so many have before, and yet it's becoming increasingly difficult for them. It's and it's sad, real yeah. journalism. And, and honestly, it's part of why I I mean, I look, I I subscribe to a couple of print newspapers. I, I encourage other people to do the same. I you know we got a great, uh, we actually have amazing uh, something like three or four print news right just for Santa Monica alone. You know, obviously Daily yeah. Press. We're very active high, here. There's so much them, here, but <laughs> but but, uh, but we need to su- we need to keep supporting uh, local and national press. Yeah. Not just you know just because there's a firewall, you know. Ple- like consider it's, consider the damage that is done when we don't step up and help to fund media, uh, yeah. good high quality media together. Just to give you one little example, by the way, Evan, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I heard not too long ago uh, a, a study that was done that showed that in those communities that don't have a a local newspaper, the bond agencies charge those communities a higher interest rate 
for to, to borrow for municipal bonds and for school bonds and, and water bonds and all that kind of thing. There is literally a, a they, they give you a, a slightly higher uh, interest rate because they're taking on a higher risk because when there's a strong local press, there's the, you know, the, the city council members and the city government, the school district knows that there's someone watching over them. There's more there's, transparency. There's more transparency. There's more scrutiny. Wow. There's more attention to, to detail and, and less likelihood for there to be a mistake or fraud. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. So, so we actually pay a cost as a society yeah. when we don't have a strong uh, press. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. super interesting. That's wild. Well, and I think that kind of goes into the idea that, like, so many people, you know, like even on this last ballot um, a few weeks ago, or yeah. a month ago, whatever that was, people call you and they're like, oh, who should I vote for? Right. And it's like, that's... If you, if I tell you who to vote for, you're not being a citizen, a, a real citizen here, right? I can tell you who to vote for. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. If, you, if I'd love to see the people that I like win, but now you're not participating in the democracy. And part of your job as a citizen, I believe, is to understand how things like that work. How, I mean, what percentage of the population do you think understands how state bonds work? Yeah, not, not, not super high. But, but, but look, okay. I, I, I agree with you on one hand, but I want to push back a little bit sure. on the other, which is to say that not everybody, you know, I don't I don't know a lot about about, um, uh, you know, types of surgery. You know, I, I trust and respect people to go to school and learn a lot about that subject matter. And I'm going to go into the hospital when I need it, God forbid, or when my family needs it and, and trust them to do the right thing while also trusting but verifying, I suppose, you know, making sure that right. I'm, I'm learning as much as I possibly can. I don't think we should expect everybody and their mother to get into the details of bond financing. But I do think it's part of why we need good journalists. That, that's an extreme. That's probably at the extreme of, right. of knowledge. But, that but, you'd have, but, yeah. but it's part of why we need good journalists out yeah. there who do understand bond financing, sure. who can ask the tough questions. And of course, we also need smart, wise elected officials and government bureaucrats yeah. uh, stepping up to, to play those roles as well. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I look, I think you should. When people ask you who they who they ought to vote for, of course, I'd rather them do the research on their own. But if you think about it, what are they doing? They're going to go online and read a couple, I don't know, um, the Daily Press endorsement or the LA Times endorsement yeah. or the Democratic Party's endorsement. You know, in some respects, they're turning to you because they know and respect you. They know that you follow this stuff. They know you know people and you've got a better access to the system maybe that they have. Sure. And, and they trust your opinion. They may not take every single vote suggestion you give them, but um, I think they know that you, I, I don't know, I would take it as a sign of respect to you that they're asking you this, <laughs> that, they, that they do want to participate. I, 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 listen, I, I, I am, I, I, I'm sure that if you were to give them 20 of your votes, they're not going to vote with you 20 times. Sure. They might vote with you 15 times or maybe even 19 times, but, but they are, these are independent people making their own damn decisions, right? But, but they do take you into account. Yeah. You're going to be a factor in helping them determine their decisions just as endorsements, are a factor, uh, just as, as mailers are a factor. And I mean, you know, we can't possibly know everything there is to sure. know about every race. I mean, I know a lot more about the system maybe than most, and yet there's sometimes I'm really torn. You know, the two judges, for sure. example, running, I, I don't know these people. I can read you know, a certain amount about their judicial philosophy. There's only so much I'm gonna do yeah. to research. So I end up kind of relying on proxies as well to help me better determine who I'm gonna vote for yeah. as well. Well, and, and it's also, you know, this, this may be something that, um, is somewhat asymptotic to be able to, to, to solve, right? Like you can't, you'll never get to um, a place where there's a pure amount of knowledge transfer. Exactly. Right. So that's my point, I guess, in the end yeah. of the day. I mean, that's impossible. But I mean, look, the doubt, listen, the, 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 the flip side of the coin is much more dangerous than what you just described, which is to say only people who really are fully informed end up participating. And then as a result, Can you end vote. up getting, you yeah. end up getting a very small portion of the population. Right. It really sent, and then, and then decision-making ends up focusing on the elite. Uh, we, we've got, I mean, Australia. Or the, or the most educated. Or the most educated. Yeah. Uh, or the most fired up. Yep. I mean, this is one of the problems oh, yeah. of the primary system in a lot of well, other states. Well, that's the number one, isn't it? Like right? the squeaky wheel. It's all the squeaky wheels yeah. that end up, you know, so, so these members of Congress that are saying all this crazy stuff right now, when you understand who it is that they owe their elections to, you start to understand why it is that they're so wild. Yeah. And it's because they're really focused on the partisan primary voters in their gerrymandered districts back home that are actually a very small portion of the population, but they're super fired up. Right. And as a result, they're, they're, they, they're incentivized yeah. to go off the deep end <laughs> you know, with yeah. their messaging and their positions.
yeah. because of that small portion. So, and that's that yeah. portion is sadly what most people, I believe, think is the reality. Yeah, is that extreme messaging, and this gets to that sort of point that we've talked about before, is like when you make a ticket for a ticket, sorry, uh, <laughs> a policy. Um, I'm like in customer service mindset. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The um, the when you have a policy and let's just say it's I don't know climate, whatever. And Ben Allen, if you vote a certain way on this policy, you know Ben Allen supports this policy or Ben Allen voted against this policy. Right. Right. So the people going against you who want you to lose or would say that I can't believe he voted against this policy. Um. Uh, and you didn't necessarily for what I'm talking about, but no, for but, the sake, but they don't realize how much is behind that, totally. that you're voting no. against. It's all the other stuff. And it's I'll tell you, I, mean, I run into yeah. this problem a lot, actually, because the, the process of crafting bills is messy, right? Uh, you know, think about your conversation, I don't know, a conversation you've had with your wife recently where, um, you know, where, where, maybe you're trying to make a decision about where to, where to um, have your kid go to school or, 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 or some you want to remodel the house or something. You know, there, there's, it's it's oftentimes a long negotiation. Right. Where you know, where you have many conversations. The legislative process involves votes along the way, and each vote is part of that negotiation. And just because um, you you disagreed with going with this contractor doesn't mean you don't want to do a remodel. You just right. Might, you know that just that particular contract may not have been the one that that you thought was wise. Uh, you, you were interested in a slightly different approach. And yet the vote that's on the record is you voting against that contractor right. or voting against that particular bill in that particular form. Right. And that is one of the many challenges of, of serving in this position because you have to cast a yes or no vote on these bills. Yeah. And sometimes you, you may love the idea or the core thrust of a bill, but there may be a lot of details in there that give you pause. Yeah. If you just vote for that bill without any... Uh, without any, asking any questions or any caveats, you, you are, un, you know, for better or for worse, rubber stamping what's in the bill. Um, what ends up happening, of course, is that people say, well, I'll vote for this to continue the conversation, but I reserve the right to not vote for it later. That's confusing to people, sometimes in the general public, but you know, within our system, it, it's important. But what ends up happening sometimes is that, that sometimes when things get really toward the end of a vote, where, 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 you got, where it's literally, this bill is either going to go into law or not, or it's going to go to the governor's desk or not. Then, then you you gotta you have to kind of make a decision ultimately. Okay, you know, am I gonna? I, I believe in sixty percent of what's in this bill, but I really am having a hard time swallowing thirty yeah. percent. Am I gonna take the decision to vote for it anyway? Yeah. And and that becomes a really tough thing, and and, and it can be so easily characterized uh, out out in the public when people don't understand all that went behind. Yeah. And and you know it's part ben of ben Allen's responsible right. for this one aspect of a thing, and then they'll, right. they'll they'll focus on the aspect of the bill. Yeah. Right. And yeah. be like, or, or they'll focus on the part of the bill that 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 you know that that, that everyone can agree with. Yeah. Uh, and he voted against you know X, Y, and Z. Well, whereas real you know I had no problem with X, Y, and Z. In fact, I like X, Y, and Z. Well, the problem was J, K, and L that were also stuck in the right. bill. But and the bill the bill doesn't read well with J, K, and L. Right. The bill says climate bill. Right. So now whether you vote for or against it, I, I think that's one of the right. things that many people don't know is the process and what's behind right. it. By the way, sometimes I just go up, I've said, you know, this is important enough. I'm still going to vote for it, even if I, because every every bill ultimately is a, is a product of compromise. I mean, I, I brought up the, the plastics bill I just worked on. You know, in order to pull together all those people, everybody had to make a certain compromise. There are a lot of people in business who, who think the bill go way too far. Certain people in the environmental community thinks that the bill doesn't go far enough. Yeah. You know, and there were people who were complaining on both sides right up to the end, uh, raising concerns. Oh, I wish we'd done this. I wish we'd done that instead. And in the end of the day, you could you could you know parse these things apart till the cows come home, and then never, never do anything, uh, because in the end of the day, you also have to pull together enough of a coalition that really is broad based to get bills across the finish line. And um, you know, Mike Feinstein actually just wrote an interesting piece you know, to to certain Greens, for example, who obviously are hardcore environmentalists. Uh, who I tend to agree with on, on you know, a lot of environmental issues, who were complaining about the bill, uh, uh, you know, not being as strong as they would have liked to have seen. And, and Mike makes the point: Look, guys, you know, it's either, you know, it's it, it's either this or nothing at all. Uh, you know, there was a ballot measure out there, but for a lot of reasons I can get into, we we thought that at the end of the day, after the opposition was going to spend 150 million dollars kicking the crap out of the ballot measure, we. You know, the polling data that I saw suggested it was going to eventually lose. So having a really strong bill that might, you know, that, that goes 90% of the way is still such a win. 
And but yet there are some people out there who focus on the fact that it didn't get you to 100 percent, you know. And right. So, well, that's sort of that's the, the challenge of the job, too. Yeah. You have to make something to get you. The, you need the activation energy to get you to, say, the 80 percent mark. Yeah. And you say, well, was this good? Is this good enough to get us there so we can make refinements over time? Yep. And that's sort of with any decision you have to make in business, like even like starting a company. Yep. You, totally. We call it an MVP. Totally. Right. And of course, like, the negotiations are f fascinating, right? Like when we came out with our bill after this, all these negotiations, we got, I, I would argue that we got to 88, I don't know, 90% of the way, let's say. Yeah. And then some, but some environmentalists held out and, and actually arguably pushed us to 95%. Um, good for them, right? I mean, you know, I, I think they, you know, we, I was so worried that it was going to, the whole thing was going to collapse as a result, but they held out and ultimately we, we really finessed the language and we got to a point where, where it got even stronger than it was. And that was fantastic too. But you never quite know. I mean, these negotiations are so delicate. And uh, when you got so many people riding on that surfboard together, yeah, any little change could, could, could upset the balance. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I've kind of thought about also at the local level is, you know, whenever there's this polarity on a certain issue, maybe it's a development, maybe it's something here in Santa Monica, whatever, right? Um, and they all, they tend th commonly to become pretty toxic sometimes, yeah. and that's pretty frustrating. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's a matrix of, of possibilities and decisions. You say, okay, these are the things that we're approving, and this is the possible outcomes, right? And there's a cost benefit um, to these, to any decision that you have to weigh out. Yeah. You could put that into a table, say, here is the, the hundred things we've considered. And like you said, we agree with 88% of them. 12 of them are not good. But then you have to make the decision. Is it better? I, now I have to make a vote. That doesn't mean I agree with it 100%. Right. It means that I agree with enough of it that it's the right decision. Not that every single aspect of this is perfect. Right. But if you'll get those 12% of people who then hate you for it. Right. Now, ideally, ideally, sometimes at least you can, and this this comes down to both relationships and spidey sense. Sometimes, sometimes you're in that situation, the eighty-eight twelve, and you can say, "Look, this is a good project. Let's go. Let's go. But let's spend let's spend a couple minutes with the with the proponents on the twelve and see how many of those we can cut down. You know, are are these are these things that that you know you and I may hate totally um, essential?" for the proponent, or are they things that we could finesse or, or reduce or change or alter to make less less odious? Yeah. And I think that's also part of the, that, that needs to be part of the, the story too. Uh, uh, you know, not, not just sort of accepting things at face value where you're having to swallow a pill in order to get all these positives. Is there a way to avoid swallowing the pill while still getting the positives and, and sometimes the answer is no, but that's that's part of where real good negotiations come in. Or at least in the time allotted, right? Yeah. But this comes down to like if people don't read the the contract, right? Right. If people don't know what that decision making process is, and maybe there's opportunity for for transparency there in some way, where it's like, look, we we, we evaluated all these things, and we're people. We had to make a decision. Yeah. You know, I I had to pick yes or no. Yeah. The, the choice is binary. Yeah. The, the, the list of, of um, the matrix of, of what this is and how it affects things is virtually infinite. Yeah. We've been able to identify a hundred yeah. scenarios yeah. in this yeah. matrix, but I have to make a yes or no choice. Right. That's right. And that's, that's tricky. Right. It's very tricky. It's part of, I mean, it's part of, yeah, it's part of what makes um, being in these positions difficult, you know? And, and of course I've now had to make literally thousands and I, you know, I, I can't, it's, it's scary for me because I, I like, I pride myself on, you know, being someone who tries to take my job really seriously and be thoughtful and well-researched and well-grounded in the decisions that I make. But I can't, I, I've literally cast thousands and thousands of votes since yeah. I've been in the Senate. And I, I can't look you in the eye and say that every single vote was as well-informed as I would have liked. And so that, that does become scary for me. I, you know, I, I rely on organizations that I trust. I rely on colleagues who I trust. I rely on my staff. I try to read as much as I possibly can. I really I rely on on, on journalism, uh, but but you know uh, it, it's a it's a it, that's another that's another you know part of the story. It's part of why we need a robust civil society where and a robust you know uh, journalism class. It's always asking tough questions and making sure that t stones are being over uh, you know overturned and because uh, because you know the decision makers are being asked to make a lot of decisions that are never going to be as well informed as as. Um, as, as they would ideally be. 
God. Thousands. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Thousands and thousands. Thousands of times you've yeah. been through that sort yeah. of like struggle. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It's been, it's, you know, you get, you get um, hardened a little bit at, through that process. Uh, and I do think you end up, I think over time you start to understand, okay, which, which of my colleagues can I trust, right? I mean, which of them have delivered in the past who, you know, who, who, you know if they tell you this is a good bill and, and I'm going to address this, this, and this, you know that they're actually telling you the truth. Yeah. Some much more than others. Right. Uh, similar with organizations. I mean, there, you know, there are some organizations out there whose perspective, not only do I just agree with, I trust them. They've got good lawyers. They've got good vetting. And so if they sign off on a proposal, I'm much more comfortable signing off on it as well. I see. So, but, you know, and, and then that's also why we all have staff. You know, we've got staff who've, who've got distinct portfolios. Uh, they'll, you know, I've got a staffer that will work on a whole bunch of different issue areas, and they'll come to me with recommendations and, um, and, and suggestions. And I'll sometimes, you know, wrap back and forth with them, ask them questions, and we'll talk, we'll go back and forth for, over the decisions that I have to make. So the information that gets presented to you comes in. I mean, it must be a wealth of, of information from a variety of It is. Yeah. It is. I was going to um, ask, like, where do you get your news from, you know, in a sense? I like, mean, I'm old school. I love print <laughs> news. I, you know, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I literally, my, 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 my colleagues tease me because I love taking pictures of articles and sending them to them. And, you know, everyone, everyone gets their news from, from, you know, from their phones. But I find it a really dissatisfying experience. I mean, I, I don't mind flipping through an article on my phone from time to time. I do all the time. But... But then, you know, then someone pings you halfway through the article. Next thing you know, you're down some rabbit hole responding to a text or an email yeah. comes in. And, or, or, or there's a lot of clickbait. I, mean, I just love having my newspaper, putting my phone aside yeah. and just focusing on my paper. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm down here, I get the LA Times. When I'm up there, I get the Sacramento Bee. Um, I obviously love reading the Daily Press as well. When I, um, you know, when I, when I have, go out for a walk or take my kid to school, I'll pick up a copy of the of the local the local local press and yep. uh, the, you know, SMDP and um, and you know I also are, we have a there's a new, you know we can get the New York Times San Francisco Chronicle up up in the Capitol too so I, I just love reading the print stuff now there's also now that being said there's some great there's some really great journalism online too Politico is fantastic and uh, Cal Matters is is really really great uh, those are two really top notch um, pieces of journalism that you, you typically can't get in print. Uh, uh, so, but, uh, but yeah, I, I try, I love NPR. Um, I love PBS. I love the Sunday morning news shows, um, NBC, you know, I meet the press, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, yeah, I do try to keep my, my cable news intake. I don't know. I, I, I watch CNN from time to time and, you know, uh, but, but I, I don't know. I just, what, one thing I, one of the other things I like about PBS NewsHour, for example, right? Is it's like a it's a distinct presentation of the news that's curated. They're not just kind of making it up on the fly, trying to fill the time. Yeah. Which is, I think, you find a lot on cable, a lot. Yeah. Um, similarly, with pr- with print articles, right? They're 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 you know when, when they're well written, you really get all sides covered, and and it's presented in a very receivable format. Yeah. Um, it's hard to find. Yeah. It's hard to find. And I think with all that, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about like the, you know, information and being able to d- determine what's misinformation and what is what's real, what's not real yeah. in this day and age. It's, it's tricky um, to, to kind of remove bias and make a, a very well-informed de- decision. This is obviously one of the, the improvements that we can make. Yeah. In general, you know, when you look at the distance between government and its people, whatever that distance is in your mind, like the, the connection that needs to be made to, to, to build, rebuild trust uh, and to make it feel like, okay, well, things are working well. And maybe that's never entirely achievable. I don't know. It's very tricky being involved uh, in government. Um, what do you see that the opportunities for improvement are, uh, for reform? What are some of the top things to say? These, these overhauling changes need to be made so that we can get to a place where people are trusting um, that the people they're electing are there for them. And on top of that, I'll say one of the awards I know you won was a clean money award. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if any of that, but that's a, yeah, a cool one. Yeah, little, let's talk about that. You know? Yeah, I mean, so some of the stuff we've been talking about, so robust journalism. I think um, having just good quality oversight from, from the, the fourth estate, the fifth estate, which estate? The fourth estate. Uh, you know, from 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 journalists, right? From okay. from the press, 
uh, you know, making sure that, that people are, are being asked tough questions and that there's scrutiny and there's also a, a, a better, higher quality flow of information between the public and decision makers and, 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 and everywhere in between. Um, I think money, you, you, you raised the point, it, it, it's, a, it's got a pernicious role in the process, uh, particularly when there isn't enough scrutiny and enough attention being paid. So uh, campaigns are uh, increasingly expensive. But even, it's, it's not even, it's interesting. Some people think, well, well, why do you keep raising money once you've won if you've got relatively, um, you know, obviously you got to run for re-election, but it's much easier to run for re-election than when, the, when you first run. Well, our party leadership and our legislative leadership asks us for very substantial contributions every year. Uh, and that's done um, to help the broader cause. But that money um, is then used to help fund other campaigns around the state. And it's important for it's important to give because it helps to, you know, it plays a role in your position, in, in the elected officials position, you know, what sort of staff and offices and, and chairmanships and committee postings you get and all that kind of thing. And I don't mean to say that it's quite as quid pro quo as, 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 as it may initially seem, but there is a certain seeminess to it that, that bothers me and, and I have to live in that space. Uh, it's part of why I've been working so hard for many, many years on clean money issues, uh, Common Cause, League of Women Voters, California Clean, clean Money Campaign. Um, the, they work on transparency. Uh, they work on trying to you know, just get more, more controls over the money that's in the system. Uh, you know, more focus on the corrupting influence of a lot of special interest money that floods the system, uh, trying to influence. And it's a it's a real problem. I mean, I, I worked very closely with those guys. In fact, I'm really proud that California Clean Money Campaign, they've they've ranked they rank the legislators every every two years. And I've literally been number one in the legislature on their issues um, since I started uh, because I feel so strongly about this particular issue. I think that we're very um, money is a is a is a pernicious force in the system so i think we need to keep moving in a clean money campaign finance reform transparency direction i think that will also help uh make help to to rebalance things so that people will feel that ultimately the decisions that are being made are being made in their interest as opposed to special interests right um i also think we need some electoral reforms i mean i certainly you know, like the fact that here in California, we've been working hard to make it easier for people to participate in a safe uh, and, and fair, uh, but also transparent way. Um, so instead of making it harder for people to register to vote and participate in the process, we make, we've been making it easier while still having really strong uh, anti-fraud protections. Um, but I also think that um, that looking at things like uh, some of the some of the structural issues that we have nationally, I think the partisan primary has caused problems that gerrymandering. Uh, it has a whole set of, of issues. Um, I, as I've said before, I want to see some more um, kind of publicly funded or foundation funded um, independent news that people can draw upon. Uh, and, and then, and then I would also say we need robust participation. And I and I guess I just ask your listeners, if you know, be an active citizen, be engaged. Sure, it takes a little bit more work to show up at a. At, a, at an organizational event or to meet an elected official or voice your opinions about something than it, than it does to just retweet something. But, but it's worth it. I mean, our, our whole society is based on you know, everything that we've come to love about America, our ability to live um, you know, in freedom and express our opinions and live in safety and have you know, all of this infrastructure where we can live our lives from parks and transportation to schools and roads and you know, a cleaner environment, all those things have, they don't just kind of come out of nowhere. They come because we've had an engaged citizenry every step of the way that has gotten involved and put their 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 muscles to the, to the grindstone and try to help make our society better. And we've actually made a lot of things better because people stepped up and engaged and forced the system to change. Look at, you know, racial justice issues, for example. Um, but that, but democracy takes constant work. And as much as people would love to just kind of pretend that that uh, that you know, they don't have to do anything, that the system's going to somehow work itself out. Our system really does require participation and engagement. And so I, I guess I would just ask people, don't be afraid of the system. Don't be um, uh, so cynical that you don't get involved. I mean, if you, if you think the system sucks, fine, come in and vote for some radicals, you know, like try, try to push, you know, try, try to push your own perspective. That, I mean, that, that's part of the conversation too. 
But you know Plato's quote. What? Which one? Um, it's something along the lines of the, uh, for those who think they're too smart to get involved in politics, will find themselves governed by those dumber than them. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, sure. It's a I great, love that. <laughs> it's a great. I remember that quote. Yeah. And there's another. Yeah. And there's other ones that say like if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> right. You know. So. Um, and in Hamilton, they had an interesting um, line where it's like, it's not in the room where, if you're not in the room where it happens, right? right? Where, where like, I, there, there is an element of, if you want to be part of the conversation, then you have to step into the conversation, into right. the room where the conversations and happen and all politics is local. Um, and, and, and how I've seen it and how I've gotten involved, it's like, you can go and make change in your local community. Today, right. your voice is heard. Your vote counts one-to-one. -one. There's no electoral college. It's very easy, and it's super, super accessible. And I think that's that kind of reform to get people just even just to like, it it's almost should be part of school. Like, okay, you have to go participate yeah. in one thing you care about at, at a, in a public service level as part of the curriculum. And of course, an emotional IQ yep. uh, class. Yeah, that well, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But don't. I guess. Yeah, don't be afraid of of getting involved. I think that's. Um, it's actually really interesting. It's meaningful, and 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 and, to, and getting involved doesn't mean you're on the plane with the president. You know, prepping him for speeches. I, you know, getting involved in a neighborhood council, getting involved with a, a, a you know neighborhood organization, stepping up and, and serving on your school, your kid's school PTA. Uh, getting onto a commission, joining a local political club, um, you know, going to hear a, a talk and asking an elected official some questions, um, you know, going and, and lobbying a, a you know an elected official staff. I mean, all running for office yourself. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways. Well, to, that's your example, to do this. right? Yeah, yeah. You but, felt inspired enough to be where you're at. Yeah, but I wasn't just. I, I absolutely, but I also was doing a lot of other things too. I think it was all part of. I didn't just want to run for the office for the sake of it. I, I, I gotten really excited and engaged in policymaking. And so, um, in fact, part of what happened with me was that I, I, I uh, had, when I was at law school, I became the student member of the Board of Regents for the University of California, which was a fascinating experience. And I just love that experience so much. And I, I, I felt like I wanted to keep the, keep it going, you know? Yeah. And, and um, so that ended up, that was not an elected position, it was an appointed position, but it, it definitely, got me in the mindset where I wanted to come home and, and run and, and, um, and get, get engaged here. Yeah. So, yeah, which has been, and it's been a great experience ever since. I mean, not, you know, certainly there's been some ups and downs, but, uh, but it's been a, been a really meaningful, uh, worthwhile experience for me. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and seeing people like yourself, um, apply themselves in a way. And of course, you know, you have a, a, a particularly impressive, um, education as well. Santa Monica High School, man. Santa Monica High yeah. School, followed by Harvard, Cambridge, Berkeley. Yep, that's right. Yep. yep. See, um, we got it. Sorry, my but it was my public uh, SMMUSD education that that gave me that the preparation for it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Followed by these boards yeah. and commissions and yep. the inspiration to keep going, right? Yeah. Yeah. And but that's a mindset of public service, which I I, I know you have because well, one, I've heard you talk about it before, um, but two, I, I know you as a person. Yeah. Um, and. You know, it feels like there's a little bit of element of public service that if everyone just gets a little bit, yeah, they start to learn what gets how to how to make the change to give people um, the space to win sometimes too, sure. right? Sure. Like you can't win everything. So even when you get involved, to be able to get into that dialogue, to see that there's a lot of sides, very these things are complex. Sure, there's no real right answer sure. very most of the time. Right. Like, so you know, there's a learning of how to deal with rejection in a sense. Well, I really wanted that, but I didn't get it this time. Right. Especially, as they say, when we're involved in the, in the business of having to govern for everybody, right? We're having to bring together vast groups of people. Because everyone, I think, thinks about the law or policy as it, how it affects them and the people that are close to them. But there's a lot of other people in our society, and we got to be thinking about them too. Right. And State how we, and nationwide, right? And global. So yeah. So how do we craft solutions that that really are in the best interest of everybody? And, that, and as you say, there's no easy answers at all. No. Yeah. Well, you know, and you know, one of the and social psychology is such an important part of this. Oh yeah. Yeah. And fascinating stuff too. Yeah. Um, in the kind of recent Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade, this yeah. is obviously a a uh, sensitive issue for lots of people. Um, but the thing that I always kind of 
I guess where my head goes with, with, with this conversation is this is one of many potential issues and uh, past issues as well that we, we think about the, the, what is this predicated on? And a lot of it seems to me it's, well, what power should be given to the, to the federal government and what power should be given to the states? Right. That's sort of like the underlying thing, right? It's not always, no, don't do this thing, but rather the state should have the power. At least that's the narrative. That's the narrative. I mean, you could yeah. say that about the Civil War, too. Sure. And yet we also know there was a lot more besides just federal state yeah. tension. Sure, <laughs> of course. So without <laughs> getting into it, you know, the thoughts on you know, Roe versus Wade, I, the question is, again, let's stay kind of meta on the conversation of what power should be given to states and what power should be given to the to federal government. Where Where do you draw that line and say, you know what? I get it. That is a state issue. Is alcohol one of those things? Like alcohol, except for in New Orleans, right? Did New Orleans figure out how to like somehow not have an 18 year old? Oh, age? I think that I think they finally were forced up to 21 because the federal government said they wouldn't give them highway funds. Highway funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, That's right. They, yeah. So, so while while alcohol was technically a state decision, they were basically forced into. So no one followed that path. I national, guess. yeah, national policy. But that's um, sort of like we'll, we'll say you know Roe versus Wade is like one end of like the very intense conversation. Around, yeah. You know, and the alcohol is on the other side where it's like, you know, well maybe it's not all the way to the other side, but it's somewhere in the middle. What do you think? It's a tough question. I mean, this is, of course has been a top. I mean, this is what constitutional scholars have been grappling with for for a long, long time. I mean, I think ideally we'd all be able to come together with some basic for some basic principles and norms uh, that we can all agree upon as a, as a nation. Um, and, you know, while, while still allowing for a certain degree of innovation uh, at the state level, uh, you know, that people kept talking about states as the incubators of democracy. I think Brandeis writes about this in one of his decisions a while back and, and that there's, there's all these interesting policy ideas that come from the local level, come from the state level. I guess, you know, look, I mean, I'm a, Liberal, right? So I, I, you know, I, I kind of hearken back to the the old system that where 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 a lot was being driven by the Fed, the Feds, uh, and a lot of the states were really standing in the way of progress. From my perspective, you know, civil rights being a very clear example, uh, and and that there was a certain consensus and there was an ability in Washington where people could actually get things done. Now, of course, things are so broken in Washington. Uh, and the states, are, so so that that would argue for more state power. The, the flip side, of course, is some of the states are going so far off the deep end. Uh, so as much as I am really patriotic and and you know California guy and love love you know much of what we're doing, um, I will say that, that not only are there all, a lot of other states that I think are off in the wrong direction, I would also say that one of the problem one of the other problems with our with with the the, the trajectory of our politics is that. Uh, what used to be used to be that that both parties were truly national parties, and and when there'd be a, an election, like, the, the states were nowhere near as locked in in terms of the electoral college. You know, they'd vote for one party one year, another party the other, and they'd flip around. And yeah, you know, there was a certain degree of, of of regionalism, but not as locked in as we see today. And uh, what's what you've seen is as partly as a result of our of of the polarization and, and the regional aspect of the polarization is that not only are, are these states kind of locked in in terms of the Electoral College, but but they've now also become very heavily Democrat or Republican in the state government. And I think that leads to excess, too. I think that I don't think it's good for government as much as I, you know, I'm a proud Democrat and like the Democratic Party, want to keep seeing Democrats getting elected. Um, I do think that the system works better when there is a rational, sane dialogue going on between the two parties, not only in Washington, but also in the state capitals. And partly because of Donald Trump, the Republican Party here in California has done so poorly because people don't want having to do with that brand here. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, but I think we've lost something as a result. I think there, there, there are um, uh, the system works better if you've got uh, Democrats and Republicans who can work together in the state capitals. And I think sometimes the excesses of, of one party's you know, extremes. I mean, look what's happening right now in Florida. Let me look, you know, it, 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 it can, it can lead a state in a, in a dangerous direction. I think you're seeing this in a, in, in a number of states around the country right now in ways that are not helpful. So I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. I mean, I guess I would, I, I, I wish that we could all see more eye to eye so that we could have a stronger federal approach. 
allow for a certain amount of innovation and flexibility at the, at the state level. It's good to have a you know, different culture and different vibe. And but but it, I don't think it's good for our country to have such wildly opposite um, policies uh, from state to state. And I think you know with abortion on environmental issues. I mean, I just I just I can't. I don't think this is a good path yeah. for our country. Uh, and so as much as I'm, I'm a proud state legislator and I, I like, you know, I, 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 I want my state to continue to lead, um, I, 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 I wish we could find better consensus nationally so we wouldn't need to have um, be, be fighting these, these, you know, the, these battles to protect what we used to think were basic American rights uh, that we're now having to codify here in California. Yeah. Oh, man quite a path we have ahead it's of us. tough it's tough i mean the abortion thing and, and then this environmental stuff too i mean the fact that we you know we've now just the, this court just decided to hobble the 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 um, the federal government's ability to fight climate change the, you know, the great existential crisis of our of our time yeah. uh and it, you know as it is there wasn't enough tools in the toolkit um and now they just took away the most important tool there was uh, which is to use the clean air act to give the EPA the power that it needed to, to fight uh, climate change. So terrible decisions from my perspective and, and um, really setting us back. And, 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 and they're also going to continue this polarization between the states. You're going to have California kind of continue to go out, double down, and then other states doubling down in the other direction. It just feels like we're just, just moving in opposite directions, and it's just not healthy. So what is it that people can do? Who, you know, who are super supportive of one side or the other that didn't get their way on Roe versus Wade or anything else that's important to them. I mean, can they overturn certain policies in their state by getting you know, their ideas on the, on the ballot and getting enough signatures to start doing stuff like that? And if enough people, you know, because I think one of the conversations is like, well, that's not representing the populace. Right. And, right. and we would we don't know that for sure, of course. Right. You don't know for sure whether that's true, but I would think it's true. Well, the polling suggests that it's The polling suggests that it's yeah, true, but yeah. in order to make a difference, the polling doesn't really matter. Right. People need to say, that is true for us. We're in state Right, and, 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 and one of the problems is that we're, we're constricted by these systems, right? Like the redistricting, you know, the, the, ina- the, the inequities of the, of the Senate, right? The fact that the U.S. Senate has, gives every state the same amount of representation, even though Wyoming has literally half of the number of people that, that live in my state Senate district. Yeah. Right? So just to, you know, I'm one of 40 senators here in California, <laughs> and yet my district has double the number of people yeah. that live in Wyoming. But Wyoming has the coolest name got, for a capital. Got a, yeah, that's right. It's got Cheyenne. That's right. That's right. That's and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and their biggest city is Casper, which I think is such a cool name, too. Right? That's a so, good one, too. They so, got good names. Yeah, they got good names, but, um, uh, but, but, they, but they got way too much representation in the U.S. Senate, if you think about it from, a, from an equity perspective. Yeah. Um, so... Now, that's going to be – that's I don't think that's ever going to get solved, I mean, to be honest, at least not in our lifetime, Evan. But I do think that um, helping to build capacity within other states uh, to start – you know, look at look what happened in Georgia. Look what happened in Georgia last election, right? I mean, here's a state that's always been very you – know, at the heart, heart of the Confederacy, uh, uh, you know, pretty, pretty um, behind the times on a lot of racial equity issues. Um, you know, had elected some people to office that were pretty problematic, um, and yet, uh, and, and actually, and had, had traditionally, you know, they'd voted for Trump in 2016. This go round, people organized. People really organized. They went out. They identified the fact that there's a lot of demographic shifts happening uh, in and around Atlanta. Lots more immigrants. People coming in from different parts of the country. Uh, an, 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 an increasingly empowered black population that had always been so marginalized. And, and they, they, they sensed this and they took advantage of the moment and got behind Stacey Abrams and all of her efforts to organize people. And not only did Georgia flip, uh, you know, its, its presidential vote, but then turned around in a special, in, a, in an off, you know, in a, in a, not a special election, but, a, but not a presidential election, in a, a, you know, a, a later election, which is typically a lower turnout election, and, and voted uh, uh, two brand new people that, that flipped the the balance of power in the U.S. Senate, uh, uh, you know, a young Jewish guy and a black guy. I mean, it was incredible to, to see what happened in, in, in Georgia. Uh, so I guess I just I, I point to that as an example of how 
people power and organizing and, and coming together tactically and aggressively and in an organized, a f- tactical manner can really make a difference. And it's hard work. It's really hard work. I mean, they, and they had people, you know, waiting in long lines in, in Fulton County, you know, and they, and they got to witness firsthand the, the you know, how, how much harder it is for a black person to, to go cast your ballot in, in, in Georgia than it is for people living out in the suburbs where there's tons of polling locations and no lines and all the rest. But that organizing and that determined, you know, that dogged determination that they went into that work. And it was not, it obviously it was driven by the people of Georgia, but there were a lot of people who came in from California to help the effort and came in from all over the place, helped to fund the effort, helped to organize the effort, helped to animate the effort. Yeah. So I just, I bring that up to say that there are opportunities out there and there are recent examples of how, in spite of all the odds, people power made a difference. And, and, um, and I would argue really helped to, save our democracy. I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but after what happened on January 6th, uh, you know, I can only, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I continue to be so grateful to, to those organizers in Georgia who, who, who tipped the balance there and um, held, held firm. And so I just hope people take inspiration from that work and, and, and don't get you know, discouraged by all of the, ro- the roadblocks and the barriers. There are ways to push through. Who would have thought that in that in that kind of hard, confed- you know, kind of old Southern state, uh, a changing state, of course, but but nevertheless, a state that, that had never seen this kind of change. Uh, Who would have thought that this could have happened? And it was because people came together. And let's take some inspiration from that. For sure. I think a lot of times it's, I, mean, I guess it's when I, when I tell people sometimes and they're really passionate about something and I'm like, well, there's people who care. And then there's people who care enough to put their money where their mouth is or to put it into action. Um, and I guess part of what it feels like compelled for me to do is to get people motivated at that level where it's like, I know you care. I know, you know, you're in a country that's built on lots of these, this, this, this wacky and awesome system we have to help make things happen. Um, more wacky than awesome these days, but uh, more wacky than awesome. <laughs> but, but the awesomeness is cool. That if you yeah. if you believe in something and you care enough about it, you can make things happen. That's right. Right. Um, That's and awesome. it's an imperfect democracy. But that the whole point of getting involved is to evolve this this beautiful system that's been created for yeah. us. And there's so many wonderful things that we have that yeah we take for granted. You know. Um, that you sort of get just used to that we're complacent with yeah. of how good the quality of life is here compared to <laughs> I mean like all you have to do is travel and right. see that like I forgot what it is but it's like it's something like the lower um, the lower class of America is still within the top 5% of the world sure 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 that's all true though if you look at our peer countries we're we're on most factors way behind, you know, much higher infant mortality. So, sure. so so compared to most of the world, yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and we should, but compared know, to like France and Germany, other OECD countries, yeah, much higher infant mortality, yeah. uh, lower life expectancy, much higher obesity rates. Sure. Um, you know, it's much harder if you do grow up in the bottom quintile of our society, the bottom twenty percent, to to make it up the ladder. Much harder here than in other places. Yeah. Um, so we have real disparity problems. So, so yes, we're we're we, we've we've done incredible things as a country, but we're still um, we've got these kind of gaping inadequacies that yeah. I, I just hope we 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 can for galvanize sure. ourselves to work on. For sure. Um, yeah, I've seen you know, and it's interesting also from traveling. You realize like the government is not its people, right? The way that you perceive a government of, oh, yeah. of another country right. when you travel right. to it, right? Um, like Iran, right? People, I mean, you know. Yeah, like I've been to Vietnam and Cuba. Right, there you go. Yeah. Okay, and and both of those countries, depending on who you talk to, have these ways of thinking about it through history, right? And then you go there and you realize, wow, like everyone there is the nicest person right. and welcomes you with open arms. And Vietnam actually has the second largest population like in Orange County. Yeah. Um, and whether you're in Hanoi or uh, Ho Chi Minh, um, it was just so wonderful and welcoming, and and some of these people really don't have a lot at all. Their right. beds on the floor, they're living in you know huts, right. and they just and they love you. And I think that's sort of the difference of perspective that traveling gives you. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it also um, is part of the difference between, you know, to, to sh shift that perspective to the way that the voter tendency turns out, turns out, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, the most states, it's, it's not about, it's funny, it's like the government of, say, Texas is perceived one way. Right. Sure. Yeah, but I get but, your point. but all of the big cities right. vote blue. All right. four big cities voted blue in the last right. election, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's not even a question of government right. or people. It's a question of urban versus rural yeah. a bit. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder how that factors into the way that people perceive just even Texas. Like, Texas is an amazing state. Right. Yeah. Forget about the, the, some of the policy stuff. They barbecue. Like, oh, they got wonderful <laughs> things there. Yeah. yeah. And so, you yeah. know, I try to, that's part of the divide that I think is sometimes unfortunate too. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, that's absolutely right. Right. Our governments can sometimes, and our policies can sometimes divide us more than we would naturally be. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, look, I mean, look, you can say the same thing about any war that's ever been fought, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're fighting over, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, the, the, I mean, there's been, especially during World War One, there was such great work written about how just ridiculous it all was. We were mowing each other down and um and yet there were these moments where the you know on christmas the guy german and french and oh English yeah. got up and started playing soccer mm -hmm. together they came and together just, and just sort of recognizing their common humanity I know that and how, story, how just yeah. how crazy it was that they were just blowing each other up during the every other day of the year i think they got all yelled at for that yeah afterwards yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah they did but it's become one of the most touching stories of the whole war it's beautiful of, of yeah, almost any war yeah ever um, well, yeah, and then also singing, they were singing carols across the yeah across the, the, the common their common yeah, across the no man's land, mm -hmm. and they had you know, different lyrics, of course, different languages. Where was that? Was that in France? It was on the front. Yeah, yeah. World War One. Um, yeah. Ben, we can talk for hours, um, but um, what do you want to leave people with if you had to tell them? I'm sure you could tell them a hundred things. But pick one that's been top of mind that you can, you know, leave people with here today uh, that you feel is important. Yeah. I, well, look, I just it kind of it's a recurring theme in the conversation today. Just w first of all, our democracy is so valuable. Uh, we take it for granted. We have to engage and we have to keep it strong. And that involves everybody's participation um, to some extent or another. Right. We're not expecting everybody to, you know, you can't have, you know, 300 million in presidency of the United States, but you, but you, but but we we do need to have everyone step up and be a citizen, you know, and, and be a participant and and a, and, a, and have a stake in our in our democracy, and and I would say, don't be intimidated. Figure out a way to connect to the to the to our democracy that 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 resonates with you, and if that's just through voting, fine. That's a that's a, that's a very important way to participate. Um, you know, it's the most important way to participate. But if you, if if the kinds of things that you hear on this podcast, in this conversation, or in the news, or wherever else, r inspire you to get more involved, you know, if there's an issue that you care about, get involved with an organization that's doing good work and advocacy in that space. Um, if you got some extra money lying around, give money to an organization that you care about, or to a candidate you care about, or a campaign that you care about. Uh, if if you know if if there's an interesting talk that's coming up, go go show up, join a club, join. If you want to get more involved in your community, there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, you know, as I say, a commission, a neighborhood group, um, and then of course, you know, get involved with the campaign, running for office yourself. But also, people, you know, people running for office need help. I mean, it's never done by the candidate, right? It's always done through a team effort. And if there's someone you believe in or a cause you believe in, get involved in that cause or that candidate's work. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, we, you know, most elected officials and, and governments have have good staff and, and don't you know, discount working with the staff. Um, oftentimes the staff is sometimes m just as much, if not more, engaged on a particular issue that you care about than the elected official. And so don't ever forget that. You know, sometimes people just want to work with, you know, I just want a meeting with the senator. And yet sometimes the staff are actually more is better place to solve the problem. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes. Right? Shout out to your staff. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I got a great team here. And, and I would just say, any issues that folks have with state government, please don't hesitate to reach out to our, our office. Um, we've got a, we, we've been helping just literally thousands of people over the course of the pandemic. I mean, I, we were just at an inventory and it was an extraordinary number of people whose lives we were able to help through just, just navigating the waters of 
pandemic insurance, you know, either unemployment, um, you know, insurance, uh, small business loans, dealing with an issue with the DMV. I mean, the, the number of issues that people have had to deal with over the past couple of years, we know how tough it's been for folks. And, and we just, we're always trying to help. Uh, and if we can't solve the problem because it's a problem, a federal issue or a state, you know, local issue, we, we can always find a way to help connect people with, with the, the, the relevant and appropriate person. So, you know, don't, just don't hesitate to reach out and, and before assuming the worst in, you know, in those people who are in government, um, you know, it's appropriate to assume the worst about some people maybe, <laughs> or at least, but, but do a little bit of research first sure. and, and try to get your research from different sources and not just the same sources. And don't just believe everything that pops up on your Facebook feed. You, know, do, you would owe it to yourself and you certainly owe it to your fellow Americans to, uh, to, 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 to go beyond the Facebook feed, right. <laughs> you know, to go beyond your Twitter feed and, and to do a little bit more of a deep dive before um, forming a, a, a vitriolic opinion about someone and spouting it out to everybody else. Well, I'm sure if people watch this uh, vodcast uh, or podcast, however they get it, um, they'll see that, you know, for example, Ben is a person with feelings and thoughts and Try opinions. And, <laughs> and, and, and there are people behind... Um, in that in that position that are that are just people yeah um, and we're totally. all just people so absolutely it's all people and and we all make mistakes and but you know I think at least most elected officials actually really care about what people think because you know we owe our elections and our jobs to, to the to our constituents and so we're anxious and eager to hear from folks too great well um, there's a, a, a few friends who wanted to say hi uh, today, yeah, um, they couldn't be here in this moment. But Lana Negretti, yeah. Greg Morena, uh, and Dom Bay, who yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, um, send their love. And Kristen McCowan, you were mentioning too. Right? And Kristen McCowan, yeah. yeah. And there's an example, right? We were talking earlier. I mean, here we have four people who are all, um, you know, uh, uh, once or former, um, you know, elected city council members, elected officials, and we were all in student government together at San Monica High School in the '90s. Yeah, <laughs> and now you know three became city council members. I'm in the, in the state senate. I mean, it's a it's a we were just kids growing up, you know, together working together on, you know, trying to improve life for students. You know, working on the, the events, but also trying to. I remember us all going into lobby for an additional minute of passing period because people were getting in trouble for you know being one minute late to class and <laughs> you know, little things like that. Like it's a you know that seems like a silly thing, right? But that's like a tangible way to help a student community and we were all working together on that now that we're all now we're all kind of trying to help make our community and our state better and so that's just an example of, of how um, you know as much as it may not always feel this way our government really does have a lot of real folks who grew up alongside you that are trying to make a difference sometimes imperfectly uh, but trying to make a difference so yeah even in high school yep yeah. yep um, well thank you sir I'd love seeing you, and I, I yeah, uh, I loved having you here today. And speaking, you're a serious public servant in your own right. I mean, we were just talking before. I I, I just want to personally thank you as someone who um, who loves this community and and has just seen it get so much more colorful as a result of your work and all the murals that Beautify have done, has done over the years. And and you were just such an inspiration in helping to make that happen. Now, you know, I I unfortunately I have to fly a lot for work, and sometimes I'm. I'm, I'm on Lincoln Boulevard, and just the way you've transformed that that street, it just it just changes the vibe. And so I just want to thank you for um, for all the love and care you've put into the arts and and just making our our community look a little bit better. Thank you, I appreciate that. It means a lot. Yep. Well, so, we man. always end with a yeah. uh, a handshake Good. and of course a high five. High five. There you go. <sighs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Good and man. Thank you. I will see you fun. soon. We'll do this again. All right, bud. Yeah.